our last lecture, we uh, we talked about the uh, the aristocratic class in the Republic, and we we talked about the uh, features of the aristocrat's life, which are, of course, the features of the whole of the Republic. Uh, that is, that uh, they the, the aristocrats. Uh, uh, are the leaders of the Republic from the aristocrats comes the philosopher king and they lead the most austere of, uh, of lives the simplest of lives as we were saying um, I guess we were trying to get rid of that idea of the aristocrat that derives from Dickens's uh, tale of two cities of uh, yeah uh, you know the, of the faults of uh, uh, yeah, well, there, that is French there, decadence, yes, yes, which is not uh, what no. Plato means at all. No, not at all. That's that is the decadence of aristocracy. When an aristocracy goes bad, then you begin to get exactly uh, what uh, what Dickens talks about, or what you found in the uh, in the South at the in the decadent period of the uh, the American uh, South. You found you got you got a decadent aristocracy, but that's. Uh, that's certainly not what, uh, what obviously, what Plato is talking about, what Socrates is talking about. Um, if we uh, look at it from a practical uh, point of view rather than theoretical, that is, Plato talks theoretically. He, he, he says there are four, or you could count five if you, if you count the tyrant, I suppose. Uh, but there are basically four uh, societies, the aristocratic, the timocratic, oligarchic and the democratic and then there is the fifth the, the, the tyranny <clears throat> which is, a, is not really a society it's a slave state uh, it's the dissolution of society, society itself it's a society in which there is no justice at all it's a society uh, ruled by injustice which is a paradoxical way of saying it it's that kind is, of a shadow have. of the aristocrat the, yes. the tyrant has all of the uh, uh, qualities of the aristocrat in reverse <laughs> that is it's a complete negation uh, of the one we'd start out with so in a way you can explain the one by the other uh, and, and oddly enough people do tend <clears throat> or it isn't really odd but uh, people do tend to identify the aristocrat with the tyrant and sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. That is, when you get down to practical cases, the, uh, the man who comes along in a condition of chaos, uh, which is the condition that precedes the ascendancy of the tyrant, uh, the man who, who appears and, and, and says that he is going to take charge uh, may well be a tyrant, or he may be an aristocrat. It's hard to tell them apart. It's hard to tell them apart because they yeah. they do have certain uh, external similarities. You know, again, the uh, again when we say tyrant, I suppose today, immediately out of the newspapers at this moment that we're talking, or in the last year, people <clears throat> would think of the uh, former president of the Philippines, uh, Ferdinand, Marcos. Ferdinand Marcos, as the as the tyrant. And then the newspapers made fun of his wife's shoes because she had 10,000 pairs of shoes. And <clears throat> what he flew out of the Philippines with a train with a plane load of uh, jewelry and so forth. But really, that is a kind of parody and possibly a, a media uh, invention. I don't know, uh, but uh, but it's a parody even of the tyrant, uh, the real tyrant is again a very simple man, very austere, very strong. I mean, think of Mao Zedong, yeah. I think of Fidel Castro or Lenin. Uh, these are the, uh, are the great tyrants of the 20th century, and they have about them a kind of asceticism. Uh, in a way, uh, they, they, it's very difficult uh, to distinguish. In a way, uh, they're ph uh, philosopher kings. That is, they, but instead of philosophy, it's ideology. Uh, that, that is, they have an idée fixe uh, rather than a real uh, philosophy. But they certainly do have something that they're dedicated to, something that they give up their lives for. Yeah, well, they, they have a kind of greatness about them. They have a kind they, of greatness. They have magnitude, at least, yeah. uh, and, and that's yeah. why uh, it's, <clears throat> they, have, they have big ideas yeah. <laughs> often. Plato distinguishes them, I think, most sharply from the aristocrat in, in, in this respect. 
that they they have no philosophy. That is, they have never contemplated the idea of the good. Uh, they derive their idea. They have an idea. They have their ideology, but it's a pseudo idea. It, it really derives from a contemplation of the mob, of this beast uh, that they learn how to manipulate. Did we talk yeah, about we did. the beast? We I did, think. right. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the terror is a, is, is a man who has a political philosophy, but it's a political philosophy that derives from a kind of scientific study of the nature uh, of the mob rather than the nature of the good. Uh, Plato's aristocrat is a man who uh, is totally dedicated to the good and the true and the beautiful. And the reason why he becomes a leader is that at a certain stage of history, the mob comes to its senses. That is, the mob, under usually under conditions of extreme adversity, the mob realizes that it's lost and that there, there must be a way. Uh, a man who's hungry, for example, who's really hungry, uh, knows that he wants food. Uh, he, he's hard to fool, at least about food. Uh, uh, there, there are times in history when uh, a whole uh, uh, people, I, I can't say society because I'm talking about a time in history when society breaks down and there isn't any law, there isn't any order and suddenly someone says, well, follow me and that man, if he knows where he's going and if he really has, uh, is a philosopher, if he really understands the truth, uh, that man is the aristocrat. Yeah, well he is not, he is not really a product of that society. No, he's not trying to please it. He's no. not trying to uh, to be its leader, even. Yeah. In fact, he, he has to be forced to be the leader. He doesn't want to be the leader. Yeah, really. we uh, pointed that out, I think, last time. Yeah. He, he will do it only only when circumstances are so bad that nobody else but he can do it. You, and usually he's the only one. Well, Moses, maybe, you yeah. know, in the supernatural order, of course, I mean, that changes everything because he was called by God. But you can look at him from the natural point of view, and he would be a, a perfect example of the aristocratic leader. Uh, the, the, the Jews were at the end of the rope. And, uh, well, they were in a condition of absolute slavery. Yeah. And, uh, and really, he was the, the, uh, the one person who, uh, who was called to. And, and there is that, always that, that, that aspect of a certain kind of calling. Yes. Uh, that is, they're, they're reluctant, and they, it, it falls upon them. There's nothing they can do. They, they are more or less, they have to do it uh, in order to save uh, their people to save the whole society. I suppose today, so we're living in a, in mostly a, a democratic society in Plato's sense. That is, we we're we're living in an oligarchic society breaking down into a democratic society. That's about where we are today. And in that stage, uh, uh, people are pretty skeptical about aristocrats. They don't think they really exist. Uh, <clears throat> they think they're myths. They'll tell you that uh, well. If you really knew the truth about Moses, you know, uh, blah blah blah. They, they, they would, they would insist that there were some, some scandal that we just don't happen to know about. Uh, the debunker, uh, who writes rewrites history, tells you that George Washington was really nothing but uh, this or that or whatever they happen to think that they can call him. Or Julius Caesar uh, was was ambitious as... Uh, yeah, but he was a tyrant. <laughs> he was they, a tyrant. Yeah. Try to identify yeah. him. Uh, we tend to doubt the real existence of, of these people. And I suppose one of the reasons is that they're pretty hard to find today. Uh, that is, they don't shine in a democratic society. They're not uh, media people. They're not uh, le leaders in that sense. Uh, they don't manipulate the mob. They, they have no ability to do that whatsoever. They're rather... Uh, 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 being philosophers, uh, their whole uh, bent is really toward something uh, other than, well, we, we would almost say something other than this world. Yeah, well, they're they're contemplative, uh, contemplative. people, and uh, they um, uh, they they're drawn toward the contemplative life rather than the active life. And and when they when they're in a society which is so 
discreetly anti-philosophical, uh, then their their tendency to withdraw from the world is uh, is exaggerated, uh, and they uh, they simply disappear. You don't see them at all. Yeah. Uh, you don't know where they, they don't are do well or what the they're doing. Okay. No, no. And uh, uh, again, we, we always have to in this day and age. We always have to talk a lot about words <clears throat> because uh, they they do lose their um, their value. There's a there's an inflation or a deflation or anyway there's a a devaluation of the of the coinage. Uh, the word philosophy, I think, has to be uh, distinguished too. When we say philosopher king, two words, king philosopher, are likely to be immediately uh, misunderstood. Uh, we're likely to think of the king as a tyrant, as a false aristocrat, and we're likely to think of the philosopher as a professional uh, scientist of some sort. Uh, or, or if not scientist, at any rate, a man out of the library. Yes, uh, yes college ac professor. Academic, yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, as, as Jefferson pointed out in a, in a famous essay called The Natural Aristocrat, uh, I was going to say Jefferson pointed out that and then I was going to make some kind of historical blunder because I don't remember the details of the essay. I was going to say Daniel Boone is an aristocrat. Now maybe I've got my uh, my time. <laughs> maybe uh, <clears throat> I don't remember when Daniel Boone flourished. Maybe Jefferson was earlier. I suppose he was. I don't I know. Think he was. I don't yeah, <clears throat> but but the type of, of Daniel Boone, that is the type of Natty Bumpo uh, in yeah. uh, uh, Cooper. uh, Cooper's uh, novels, uh, the frontiersman. Uh, the, uh, the woodsman uh, would come closer to Plato's idea of the philosopher than an academic, uh, uh, than a professor sitting in a library writing books uh, about uh, existentialism or whatever. Yeah, well, after, after all, the uh, the, uh, the philosopher is a man who has a uh, who has a love of wisdom and who has a grasp of the real. Uh, and uh, as you go through these various stages of society, there, uh, uh, Socrates says that these are arranged. He discusses them in a in an order, and he says that that uh, the the just society, the perfectly just society, is the aristocracy, and it is succeeded uh, normally by a, the uh, the timocracy, and that is succeeded by the oligarchy, and following that is the the democracy, and after that, ordinarily comes the tyranny. That uh, what happens is that the real, the grasp of the real, uh, weakens uh, at, as you pass through this cycle downward toward the tyranny. Um, in a in a society dominated, for example, by the media, uh, our own times, which is is one of the most democratic elements of our society. Uh, then, then reality uh, becomes very remote. Uh, there, there's very little grasp. Of it. How do you find out what really happens? You know, how do you find how out you what, know? what really happened? Well, what, you, what is President Marcos <laughs> really like? What is his wife really yeah, like? How, we don't how know. Do we know? How we, would we, we have know? to take take the word of the of the of the press? Uh, and uh, but the but the aristocrat, after all, is a man who knows, uh, you know, which which direction is north. Um, and how he knows it, we do not know. He, he, as I said, he's not a product of society. If he were a product of society, he would have no idea which direction was north. If you set him down in the wilderness, so so that uh, the, the so that the the frontiersman, the, the deerslayer, deerslayer, uh, it has a more philosophic mind mm -hmm. uh, than uh, than the. The so-called philosopher. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in fact, that's the the, the philosopher that uh, Mr. Senior is talking about. That is the one that we tend to confuse now with uh, the philosopher. Is is a kind of decadence of philosophy. Uh, once again, when uh, as you go down the uh, through these these phases of society, uh, when when uh, philosophy retreats uh, to the to the uh, to the library. Uh, when uh, when art uh, retreats to the museum, uh, when it's no longer associated with uh, human experience, well, then then you've lost you've lost art, you've lost uh, philosophy and music and all of those things. Uh, they uh, they no longer pervade 
the society at all. Uh, they're separated, estranged from the society, and they fall into a kind of decadence. I, re I remember a student we had years ago who uh, uh, went off to a graduate school and studied uh, philosophy. He came back after a year very excited by, by everything that he learned, and he said uh, that we, uh, in, in our course, had always said that we were not philosophers, that we were dwelling primarily on the level of poetry, uh, and uh, that is uh, dealing with reality in a, in a poetic mode. Uh, and Plato is primarily doing that in the Republic. But that in the poetic mode, you get a view of what philosophy is. But we had always clearly said that we ourselves were not philosophers. And this fellow said, and you know, I always thought you were just kidding, uh, that you really were philosophers, that you were just being modest. But now that I've been to graduate school, now I really know what philosophy is. And I agree that you fellows, you aren't talking about philosophy at all. <laughs> well, I got kind of mad. <laughs> not, I, I, I still am not claiming to be a philosopher. But by golly, what he was drunk on was precisely not philosophy at all. Uh, that is, uh, uh, poets are not philosophers, but poets know what philosophers are. <laughs> that, that is, that is, we're 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 looking uh, through the same uh, uh, window uh, at, at reality. We're we're looking uh, in in, uh, uh, in the same direction anyway. At reality. Yeah, no. The, the what he was talking about was academic. Uh, no, the, the uh, academic philosopher. History of ideas, day, something yeah, like that. Uh, is 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 more estranged from philosophy right. than than uh, uh, the humblest uh, of the frontiersmen. Uh, uh, they they just are not interested in what uh, Socrates calls wisdom at well, all. Socrates didn't have a. PhD. No. <laughs> he was not really uh, what we today would call an educated man. But he, he was the philosopher. Uh, he is the paradigm of the, of the philosopher. And we would say of George Washington, for example, who had a modest education. Uh, I forget now. I, I read his life not too long ago. Uh, but he, he never went through what we today would, would call college. He had a good uh, uh, education uh, of the kind that a gentleman, uh, he, he became a an apprentice to a surveyor. Yes, uh, right. he, uh, uh, he never went to, to engineering school or he didn't have such things. But, uh, but, but he had a philosophical mind. He had that reflective uh, uh, mind. Everyone said so uh, mm -hmm. who, who knew him. And in a way, uh, you don't derive that knowledge of Washington from his own writings. You derive it from what other people say about him and from his deeds, from, from, uh, from what from what everybody says, he was the kind of man uh, who understood reality. I think that was that was what he what he had, uh, and it and it went from the simplest thing like finding your way in the woods, all the way up to war, uh, finding your way through a battle, uh, to uh, uh, to knowing what what's best for the country. Uh, they say that when he became president, that he wasn't all that good. As a president, uh, he, he wasn't. Uh, uh, that is, he wasn't um, uh, uh, the kind of fellow who does well at uh, uh, the day-to-day -day details of administration. No, well, he had. A, uh, he was surrounded by very brilliant men. Uh, uh, who was the? Well, Hamilton. And, Hamilton. Uh, yeah. uh, Hamilton was the most brilliant of all of the men around him. Everybody, every I think everybody conceded that. But nobody wanted Hamilton to be president. No. They said, now if you have a, if you have a really difficult problem uh, concerning you know the budget or something of that sort, you go to Hamilton. He can handle that. And and that's what uh, that's what Washington did, or that's what he usually did. And sometimes uh, he was wrong when Hamilton was right yeah. uh, about matters yeah. of that well, kind. Yeah. But uh, but every but nobody wanted Hamilton nobody, really nobody, to be president. <laughs> no, 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 no. No one wanted any of these very brilliant men. I mean, Lord knows the people that were, that were in, in his in his cabinet. Well, any one of them, we would be delighted what a, what a to have, have as a president now. Yeah. But uh, in those times, uh, both the, the people on both sides uh, politically uh, turned to Washington unanimously. They said he is, uh, uh, by any measure, he is the the greatest man among us in in an age of really really remarkable men. 
they were completely unanimous in their in their really a kind of uh, admiration, which we we find hard to understand. Again, in our age, we tend to think it's a myth. Yeah. yeah. But if you go back to the contemporaries, uh, boy, they didn't think so. No. Uh, they no, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, uh, you even find there is a contemporary uh, historian who uh, who says exactly that. He says that it was. Uh, he says. Uh, Washington is a myth come true. He said he he really lived up uh, to what we now think of as the myth of Washington. Um, it's it's very rare to find anyone saying that, but as a matter of fact, there there is an historian who says that. You mean a modern today? Yeah, a modern right, historian. Right, right. I remember yeah, you mentioned yeah. that. Uh, Forrest MacDonald, yeah. I happen to know him. Yeah. Uh, he wrote a little book on Washington, and it's very good. And he talks primarily about the reputation of Washington among his contemporaries, and he says, well, he deserved that reputation. Um, uh, I think a lot of the things I've said uh, simply derive from that yeah. book. Uh, you know, uh, when you think about um, your own education today, young, young people who are, <clears throat> are studying, uh, we assign books like Plato's Republic and uh, We'll go on uh, next. Well, I guess we'll go on to Homer again. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go, go back, back to the Iliad, and, and and then go on to Herodotus. These are the great books of the world, but uh, really, there 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 must be also at the same time uh, going on uh, another part of your education, which doesn't have to do with your studies. It has to do really with uh, what you might do for fun uh, when you're off duty. And you're you're not involved in your study. Uh, you might pick up a book and read it. And uh, what would you call that? A peripheral education, or uh, the occasion of education, the uh, the cultural soil of your education. Uh, uh, you you cannot study in a vacuum. Uh, you've got to have other things that you know. And I'm leading up to saying you couldn't do better than to read a really good book on George Washington, for example. Yeah. Uh, that is, every everybody, every American certainly, uh, really must have that in his memory. Uh, the, the best one is written by Washington Irving, but it's too long. It's very long. <laughs> it's very long. Uh, it's very long. Uh, and uh, but there is a there are a couple of excellent uh, shorter books. I'm trying to think. Uh, did. Um, uh, did our old friend Owen Wister do a George Washington? Wait a minute, he did. Yes, he did. I think he, he did. did. Yes, I he think did. He did. Yes, he did. Absolutely. And that, I that's a good. I have that's a good. Yes, it is. It yeah, is. I, I, I was trying to remember whether it was Wister or somebody else. No, you're right. A little book. You're right. It isn't more than 150 pages. It's, it's a short book. It's called The Seven Ages of George Washington. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. That's I can a remember. Great title. Yeah. Beautiful book. Uh, Owen Wister is the author of The Virginian, and uh, he's a, a, a fellow uh, who, uh, well, he was a democratic man. Uh, he, he comes from the next stage of society. He can, uh, he's a contemporary of Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt a friend, uh, friend of, of Teddy very Roosevelt. Close very friend. close friend of his. Uh, him, and of course, wrote The Cowboy, the, the paradigm of all cowboy s stories, uh, The Virginian, all about uh, the early days of Wyoming. Uh, and that's about a democratic man. Uh, uh, who lives in the next stage of society, the Timocratic man, the word in, in Greek means uh, honor. And the Timocratic man is, is one who is not himself an aristocrat, but who uh, imitates the aristocrat, who honors the aristocrat, and who lives according to an unwritten code based upon the, the deeds of the aristocrat. Uh, the democratic society lasts a lot longer than the uh, aristocratic society because the aristocratic society really lasts only as long as it's needed. That is, it, it's an emergent thing. Uh, society, or I shouldn't say society, uh, society breaks down and, and there's nothing left but disaster. And in that disaster, the true philosopher comes to the front because he's a man who has a grasp on what reality is. He's a man who knows what can and what cannot be done, and he goes ahead and he does it. But having done it, having uh, got the people out of the disaster, there really isn't uh, any more need or call for the aristocrat. After Moses uh, 
gets in sight of the promised land, he himself doesn't even enter. He dies <laughs> before he gets there. Uh, it, he's a rescuer, I suppose you uh, would yeah. say. Of this Joshua is the is the uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is the uh, democratic man who who simply carries on the tradition uh, that had been established by uh, by Moses. Yeah, the the uh, uh, the the. Uh, uh, the society is put in order, I suppose you would say, created uh, it, or or put in order by the aristocrat. And once it is in order, then the, the job of the aristocrat is over, really. He, he, you can't have another aristocrat come around and set a society in order. It's already set in order. What you need is somebody to maintain that order. And the and the aristocrat is interested in maintaining it. That he can't do it. It's, That's not his gift. It's not his gift at all. No, in fact, the old uh, uh, what what uh, gee, you know, uh, this is terrible. I can't remember. Whatever becomes of Natty Bumpo? <laughs> He dies out in uh, he dies out in in Kansas, in Kansas? or oh, out in this in, in this ter- in this in this territory. I think it is Kansas, Kansas? or Nebraska. Yeah. yeah, he he dies it's rather sad. Yeah, rather I was sad. Say, he, doesn't he, he's uh, driven out really. I've never read. Is that the Prairie? Is that That's the, the Prairie? Yeah, I've never read that. I'm going yeah. to do it's, that now. It's very moving. He yeah. he yeah. He's, he of course retreats from the uh, uh, from the east because, because it gets too civilized. It becomes yeah. too civilized, and he has to go way out west uh, mm-hmm. to to find the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, but even there, it, you know, he sees. Of course, he's growing old, but yeah. that that's all gone. It's all over now, and there, there's no more need for Natty Bumpo. Again, maybe we ought to explain who he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, he was once one of the most famous characters in the world, but I'm afraid young people don't read yes. James Fenimore Cooper anymore. But he was the hero. Of a, of a long series of novels, uh, beginning, I guess, with The Pathfinder or Last of the Mohicans. Last of the Mohicans, I forget which. He wrote them in, the, in, he wrote them in order. different order. I, I that's can right. Keep that's track. right. No, that's uh, right. Some of the. Uh, I think the Pathfinder the, is earlier. The, 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 the later novels uh, fill in the earlier life. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. But, but these famous uh, books by Cooper, uh, we're not going to be naming them in the right order, but. Deerslayer, Pathfinder, The Last of the Mohegans, I guess that's the most famous one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they go on and on, and I must say I've never read all of them, uh, but uh, the last one is The Prairie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and the hero is a, is, a, is a man with the improbable name of Natty Bumpo. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the uh, beauties of the book is that he changes his name. He has many names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that is, the Indians give him uh, Indian name. Pathfinder is actually his name. Right? Or they in, call him Hawkeye. Hawkeye. Too. Hawkeye, Hawkeye in one, in, in, uh, I think in the last one he could. Yeah, the last one. He's Hawkeye. And then he's called Deerslayer and yeah. so forth. He has these names uh, that, are, that are given to him because of his aristocratic uh, qualities. Uh, they're aristocratic names. You know, I think that's true of, of aristocrats in, in history, that they're they're given names uh, like that, you know, like Alexander the Great or uh, whoever, you know. Uh, but uh, or, uh, Charlemagne, uh, this means Charles the Great. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the point that we were touching on here is that once society has been discovered, once uh, the Pathfinder has found the path, then of course he's rather, uh, his life is over. Uh, once you found the path, you don't want to find another one. <laughs> Where would you go? I mean, it would, it would only be a, a wrong path. Once you found the right one. So that the, uh, the aristocrat uh, uh, usually uh, dies, uh, frequently dies young, uh, uh, frequently uh, assassinated or uh, uh, you know, comes to some kind of violent end, or if he does grow old, there's always I don't know whether I want to say always, but th- th- there's a tendency towards sadness. Oh yes, uh, the 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 old Moses who who, who never gets to the promised land. Uh, uh, his his death is a very moving uh, thing, uh, and uh, and Washington uh, retiring to his estate, mm-hmm. uh, going back to his uh, to Mount Vernon, uh, kind of out of it. Uh, uh, Honored, of course, uh, uh, by the next generation, to be sure, but still sort of uh, you know, going back to his horses and his, uh, uh, his plantation. And Natty Bumpo, I, I, I never read that book, but I had a, an inkling that uh, it was going to end in some sort of uh, yeah, sad it's, it's way. Yeah, it's really, really very, very sad. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, uh, we've talked about the aristocrat and about the typocrat to some extent. Uh, the, the typocratic man <coughs> uh, is still around, I think. He, he survives mostly in the United States in the legends of the cowboys. Uh, Natty Bumpo was not a cowboy. He comes from the earlier. He was the, the woodsman. Or oh, he's like the uh, like uh, the mountain the man. Mountain man. The mountain man Jim in Bridger. the West. Jim Bridger Kit is Carson. the uh, they, those those are the, the scouts. Yeah, Jim uh, uh, Kit Carson, Buffalo Bill. They, they were, were the uh, they were the the aristocrats yeah, because they didn't there weren't any pants. But the cowboy followed the Chisholm Trail. That is the trail had already been marked out, and the cowboy uh, followed a tradition. Uh, now the movies have, have made a parody of it. Uh, sometimes even turned it into comedy. Uh, it's very easy to make fun of the Democratic man in some ways. Uh, he's a man who, who dresses, uh, wears certain clothes, not simply because they're useful, but because those are the clothes that you wear. Now, originally, they were useful, uh, but the boots and the spurs and the chaps and the, the bandana and the hat, uh, the Stetson, uh, that's the cowboy. Well, there it's it's a it's a very elegant uh, kind of costume. It's a beautiful costume. In fact, in the in the Virginian, uh, which we uh, often read in the fourth semester of this course, we, we uh, take that as the Timocratic as the Timocratic uh, prototype. Uh, at the end of the novel, the uh, the girl that he finally marries says, "You know, I discovered something. I found out that you are more." Uh, uh, proud of the clothes that you wear than women are. <laughs> she says that it's it's more important to you than it is to us, and and of course it's very important to her. That is that uh, that that costume of his, that uh, that out outfit. Of I see by your outfit <laughs> yeah, that you are a cowpuncher. That's the beginning yeah, of uh, yeah. the cowboy's lament. Right. Yeah. But it is, uh, and you you find it of course in in all um, often. It's uh, it is uh, chivalric. Uh, this is the uh, the uh, Timocrat is often a soldier in the first place. He's a man who bears arms. Uh, if you're going to maintain a society, uh, especially a society which has just emerged from a uh, period of, of chaos, uh, then the uh, it, there it's necessary. That there be a, a powerful uh, class of military people uh, in the West, in in the, the wild West of the United States, uh, everybody, all men, wore guns. Uh, there wasn't. Uh, you said war too. I mean, that's important. Uh, oh yes, so it's part of their dress. Yes, so. yeah. yeah. Uh, they're they're in, you, they are, they are in a condition of. They, they didn't carry them. Yeah, they wore, yeah, they wore them. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah, that no, was part of the part of their costume, and so it is in the in the Middle Ages, uh, the in the days of uh, you medieval wore a sword, chivalry. Or bear. Uh, yes. Wear, wear or to bear. bear arms. Um, the um, um, yes, and of course that is that is a it's a life dominated by tradition. There is a fixed costume. Costume. Uh, you have to wear. It's it's uh, it's mandatory, uh, and and everybody who belongs to that society, uh, uh, that is the, the the ones who actually run that society are those who belong to the chivalric order of things, and they have uh, they have customs. Uh, this is this is before the time of the written law. Um, the oligarch man is the first one to write it down. He wants contracts. Yeah, the, the written law comes in the next stage of society, but in the in the chivalric uh, society or in the democratic society, everything is based on honor. Uh, we we talk about people having a word of honor. Uh, keeping your word is always of very great importance in a in a democratic society. A man is only as good as his word. They say. Um, and if you give your word, then then that's it. And if you break your word, then you are disgraced. And the penalty is that you're you're ostracized. You're no longer allowed uh, to be in the society. You're you're you've done you've broken the code of honor. Um, and uh, there's no need there's no need for the written law. Uh, it isn't. Uh, it really isn't a. Some people, uh, again, uh, from a modern point of view, that is a, a later point of view, 
Yeah, the Democrat tends to look back on that society, or, or even the oligarch tends to look back on the democratic society and say, well, it was a rule of violence uh, and a rule of power and force. But that's uh, that's not true. That's, a, again, a kind of decadence. It's that really happens. Of understanding, actually. Yes, it's, it's quite the contrary. Uh, the understanding is that, uh, that everybody in the society will live according to this rule of honor. Uh, if they don't, uh, then they may be they may be killed. Uh, that's that's perfectly true. If they if they become outlaws, uh, then they will be killed. They will be eliminated from society. But otherwise, it, it, there there is a common understanding uh, that uh, that of what the honorable thing is to do in all kinds of transactions, whether it's in love or whether it's in business. You know, we might add that business of love, you know. The uh, aristocratic society is a society without women. Uh, well, I, I suppose I shouldn't say without women, but women aren't present. So, for example, if you take Odysseus as the aristocratic man, because this is going to lead us back into Homer, uh, Odysseus in the Odyssey is a man alone. Uh, there are no women. Uh, insofar as women occur, they occur as uh, temptations and uh, delays. Distractions. Distractions. Yeah. Uh, Circe or Calypso. Uh, that is, uh, the, 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 uh, it's a company of men on uh, a desperate adventure. Now, Penelope is waiting at home. I, I shouldn't say it's a the story isn't without women. Um, there, there, there is. Uh, I mean, Martha Washington is, I suppose, the next is the most famous first lady, uh, next to George as the most famous president. But Martha sat at home while he fought the revolution. Uh, she was always sitting at home, and he was always out on adventures. Uh, you, you, you just think of George Washington's life as one perpetually away from home, uh, in the wilderness, in the. Uh, uh, in the in the, uh, in the in the war, and uh, the mountain man. Uh, there were no women in the mountains. Yeah, he doesn't have a wife, no. or he doesn't have a wife at all. They're they're often uh, uh, well, they they are celibate. Yeah. Uh, very often, very, very they, often, the aristocrats are celibate, and if they do have a wife, uh, it's uh, it's astonishing how how little they see of them. <laughs> that is, they're they're not there. Uh, they're off. Uh, uh, living, living a very hard life, uh, in, in in an effort uh, to bring order and justice to to the society. But the democratic life is uh, dominated uh, by women. Uh, the word "dominate" is is related to "domus," meaning home. Uh, there isn't any domination in the aristocratic world. Uh, that's the point. There isn't any. Dumb, you know, we talk about the king dumb or christened dumb, that word D-O-M. Uh, there isn't any dumb. Uh, that's what's to be fought for, or that's what's to be found, or to be uh, no, the, discovered. No, the aristocrat lives in a tent, in a tent yeah. or, or, uh, or uh, on horseback, literally. Uh, he doesn't have a home to go to at all. His only home is uh, out in the field. The, cow the cowboy does everything for a lady. There, there, there is a romance. We, we talk about the literature of the democratic society as romance. The literature of um, the aristocrat is properly called epic, uh, but the, uh, the, the literature of the, uh, of the democratic man tends, at any rate, toward the condition of romance. I suppose I'm going to have to take that back because the Iliad is certainly an epic, <laughs> and yet uh, yeah, different. We, we would have to take uh, Achilles in the Iliad, this is the next book we're going to talk about, but we will begin with this uh, next time, really, with Achilles as the figure of the Timocratic man, it's certainly who lives Timoc for honor. Yeah, a Timocratic society. Uh, and, and Hector, too, yeah. uh, who lives for honor, and the whole war there is fought over Helen, who is present. She, she's up on the battlements, uh, watching the, uh, the battle. Uh, it's very uh, much like the medieval romances, where uh, 
the ladies uh, sit on the roof of the castle while the men uh, kill each other out there in the, in the tournament. Uh, uh, we mentioned uh, the Virginian as one of these novels. Uh, let, let's begin to do that. Let, let's make up a little uh, suggested outside reading that is not having to do with the course proper, but uh, books really that uh, a person ought to read uh, for the uh, for the, uh, uh, the cultural soil in, in, in which the, the philosophy grows. Uh, another one would be uh, Ivanhoe. When I when I thought of the uh, of the tournaments uh, and the medieval uh, chivalry, you, know, you always think of Scots and Walter Scots. Just great book, uh, Ivanhoe, where 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 the, the Rowena and Rebecca, uh, the beautiful ladies, uh, uh, watch the tournament. Uh, they sit there, sit there and watch the tournament and then in the battle over the castle then uh, um, uh, Rebecca uh, watches at the window and she she tells uh, Ivanhoe is convalescing he's he's been wounded and she tells him about what's going on she actually watches this uh, this battle for the uh, for the castle uh, but that's that's uh, in the Odyssey. That doesn't. There are no women there, really. No, uh, no not at all. But even you have even in uh, in the Odyssey, in the Iliad, uh, there is the one of the one of the most famous scenes we'll talk Helen, about it is well. In addition to Helen, yeah. we'll we'll talk about the uh, Andromache's uh, oh, farewell well, to right. Hector. Uh, you have a domestic. There you have a domestic scene. Woman now this is this is the Trojans. But you have the, the woman and the child and the and the father and husband who is saying farewell to his wife. He knows he's going to be killed. That Achilles is going to kill him, and she tries to persuade him not to go. Now, when you when you read the Virginian, <laughs> uh, you discover it's exactly the same story. At the end, uh, she says to him, uh, um, uh, "If you go out there and fight." I won't marry you. And he says, well, I've got to go out and fight. I, I have to do it. There's no, I have no choice. And, and of course, he knew that that was Hector. He had, <laughs> Wister had read oh, the, uh, course, yeah, had read that scene. Well, that's important. Yeah. You know, well, that's, you, you, this it's, is, it's a tradition a, again. This is a, a perennial story. You, even the, even, oh, Gary Cooper even the movie, to, uh, the sure. movie uh, High Noon, High which is a kind of classic of, mm -hmm. of westerns. That's the same plot. She was a Quaker, you remember, who who said, "I'm, I'm against all violence, and uh, if you're going to go out and shoot those men, now let's take the train." She says, she "And get out of here." Yeah. And he says, "No, I have to." stay and fight and she says well all right but if you do that if everything is off between us well it doesn't that that isn't true that isn't the way it works out but uh, he does fight and he does uh, well, kill his enemy and and she does uh, uh, still and she uh, loves him of course even more because of that uh, you love I could not love the dear so much says the poet uh, loveless loved I not honor more. See, isn't that marvelous? That little lyric, it's only a, ten lines long, but it sums the whole thing up. How does that go? I could not love thee dear so much, loved I not honor more. I'm not sure I have that. That's exactly. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's Hector yeah. talking to his wife, Andromache. And that's, now we're talking about the democratic man. Uh, uh, George Washington didn't didn't say that. <laughs> no, no. no, there's no romance. There's no romance in George Washington no. at all. It's, it's. Uh, I think people are disappointed. No. One of the reasons people are disappointed in George Washington and Martha Washington is it's not a romantic. There's no romantic no. story. I think people have been trying desperately to make one up. They want to say, well, there must have been another woman or something <laughs> there to try to make up some sort of romance, but it doesn't work. Uh, George Washington, we'd say, was not a romantic. He's a man. distant man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the aristocrat is a. Uh, he has that contemplative quality. He's an interior man. Yeah. He, uh, I, you don't go up and call him George. No. Uh, there's a distance there uh, with the uh, with the aristocratic. You, you, uh, well, I don't know if you if you have a dollar bill in your in your in your pocket, just just take it out and look at the countenance of George Washington, and you'll see right away that he would not be. You know, he, he's not uh, someone you'd, that anyone would refer to by the first name, like Ron or Jimmy Jimmy Carter. That, uh, that there was a kind of right there. Those are kind of, those are democratic presidents, yeah. and it's, uh, it's uh, you, you feel that you're able to do that. But uh, George Washington is distant and rather impassive. 
uh, doesn't you don't know what he's thinking, uh, what's going on. He doesn't smile. Uh, uh, smiling George no, Washington, no. That, 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 no. that's ridiculous. It would crack Mount Rushmore <laughs> if he ever smiled. Yeah. On the other hand, he's not cold. Uh, you see, uh, people sometimes then jump to the conclusion oh, that, yeah, no. that, this, that he's icy and and uh, and indifferent, which isn't true. He's distant, but he's not indifferent. There's a great uh, charity uh, in the uh, in the uh, aristocratic man. After all, he he gives his life. Greater love hath no man, and he gives his life for his country. And those men, or for his friend, and and those men give their lives for their, for their friends and and for their for their country. Uh, there, there is a great uh, uh, George Washington appears in one of the uh, Cooper novels uh, in disguise. Uh, huh? Is that one of the, the spy? That one? That's not one of the that's natty, not one of the natty natty one of those yeah, the Natty Bumpo ones. But it's very well done. In yeah. fact, I was wondering, did Cooper know Washington, or would he have? Um, uh, again, I don't know whether he he would have. Uh, see, he certainly lived through the the times, and mm -hmm. uh, it was a small colony after a set, mm -hmm. a set of colonies. I wonder if he, he actually hadn't known him, or at any rate, uh, certainly been in his presence. Uh, you know, heard him give a speech or something.